Robin Openshaw, welcome to Women's Wellness Radio. I'm so happy to be here, Bridget. It's always fun uh, to hang out with the great Bridget Danner. <laughs> You're like a new friend, but I'm like just latching right on to you because you have good vibes, just like your, your book that I just read. I want to talk about your book a little bit first. So your book came out. What date did it come out? Halloween. Just Halloween 2017. Okay. Yeah. And it's called Vibe. And I just first want to compliment you on your writing style. Like it's, it's not a huge book, which I really appreciate. And it's just written like almost like you'd write to like a friend, you know, it's not too academic and it's um, not too like, I don't know, like bossy. It's just like, this is what I doing. And this is, you know, it's, it's just really great. So congratulations. Thank you. You know, writing about vibrational frequency you know, you can get deep into quantum physics, but I, I didn't feel like that's what people want to learn about. They want to learn about, well, the fact that everything in life is energy and frequency and vibration, like Einstein and Tesla said, what does that mean for my life? What does that mean for little micro choices I make in my day? Plus Simon and Schuster said, don't write us an academic book. Okay. Mm. This, is, this is like, what does this have to do with me? So we kept it really very conversational. Yeah, I, I, you give the concept about like the hertz and things vibrating at a different level. And then you really dive into implementation, which is what I really like. So mostly today we're going to talk about detox, but I thought we could kind of tie that into the, to the book because the book is about um, low vibration things, which is things like anger and processed food and, and then high vibration things like essential oils and greens and love and and when we talk about detox, it's really like, it is kind of about like tipping that scale, like taking some of those things that are heavy and, you know, depleting and increasing the things that like lift us up and help our body heal. So this kind of a, yeah, maybe talk to us a little bit starting out, like how, how doing a detox, like a cert, for a certain number of days can shift our vibration. Yeah. So here's the book. Since you asked me to show it. Good job. <laughs> and, um, yours was in a different room. So Bridget asked me to get mine. Uh, you know what? Living at the higher vibrations, is, and it's measurable, we are made of electrical, mag electromagnetic energies, and we have a field around us, and we actually generate this electromagnetic field. And, and, and it has everything to do with whether we are susceptible to disease, to disease. It has everything to do with what we're attracting in the world. We're attracting more opportunity. We're attracting good health. We're attracting other good people. Opportunities, higher income happens when we are built of higher vibration materials. And so when you undergo, which, which is our topic today, is, is human detoxification, which I'm a 30-year uh, researcher in how the human detoxifies. You know, and people say, well, I have a liver for that. And I have a kidney. I have kidneys for that. I have a gastrointestinal tract that's moving through, put through all the time. I have a lymphatic system. And absolutely you do. But it's like we're living in the Dust Bowl, you know, in the 1930s with and never changing our air filter. When we, when we don't take some time to detoxify in a world where there's over 80,000 chemicals approved by our government for use in our air and water and food and more. And, you know, just an industry and cars are pumping it out. We're breathing it. We're drinking it. And so when we eliminate waste from our cells and from our organs, that's trillions of cells that get cleaned up, which allows us to be in the higher vibrations. And we feel better. We're more clear headed. We, we get into creative flow in our work. We feel more love. We feel more peace. We feel more joy. We're more excited to get out of bed in the morning. And people don't always link how toxic they are how toxic their liver is, how toxic their kidneys are. You don't link that to how they feel, you know, like what is the, the link there to depression and anxiety and all these psychosomatic illnesses that are coming out. My background is as a psychotherapist, um, but my body of work the last 10 years, my 15 books have been about nutrition and wellness. And so, you know, detoxifying has everything to do with living at higher vibrations. Mm, I love it. And then you were, you're kind of starting us off with the why, because I know people think about detoxing. They're like, oh, they kind of have a sense they should do it, but they're also kind of like terrified of like not having their coffee and like disrupting their schedule and being hungry. You just gave a lot of good reasons why. Like there's some high level reasons we can think about, like 
you know, creating loving people around us and making more income. Or maybe it's just like on a more simplistic level right now, just like clearing up your skin, having more energy, losing Less some inflammation. S- yeah. And everyone's just walking around like so dragging tired and not knowing where that's coming from. Um, and we talk about the adrenals and like, so like that, it's like, yeah, that toxic load is really slowing down your energy, right? Toxic load. I, I like that. I talk about the toxic body burden and, you know, that is, if you made it a simple math equation, it is the input of chemicals. I mean, there's research pretty recently that they take, um, they take the baby's umbilical cord away. We know they go take it away and throw it away, but when they test it, they find that a newborn baby these days has Uh, over 230 carcinogenic chemicals in her umbilical cord. And so we're actually coming into the world now these days with all these, these toxic chemicals. So we need to do something proactive. We need to do something to optimize that output because this is a time in history that is unprecedented. You know, Mm -hmm. nobody used to put nitrites and nitrates in the meat and nobody used to genetically modify all the corn and soy and nobody used to add you know aspartame and monosodium glutamate to all the snacks and just a few of many many examples people you didn't used to drink big glasses of complete non-food you know big brown liquid liquid glasses of bubbly liquid that is 100 percent chemical um you got to get that stuff out. Otherwise, it's yeah. going to gum up the works and we're going to start having diagnoses. Yeah, and I'm glad that we're going to get into some nitty gritty because even people like people listening to the show, they're probably eating well, you know, 80% of the time and they, they have some good habits. But, you know, we all have our not so good habits too, like drinking a little too much or like having chips or whatever. And then just like you said, there's all this stuff just in the environment. And we can't, you know, our organs can't keep up with it, like you said. But a lot of people don't know like how to do a detox or I don't know like sometimes if my husband and I want to do one on our own like we we kind of like start and like doesn't really continue very long you know you make it you make it one and a half days exactly (laughs) (laughs) you really need like a start date I find and an end date and like a structure because it's so easy to cheat if if you don't which I'm sure so you you've run like many detox groups what do you do you call it the green smoothie Green Smoothie Girl, Green Smoothie Girl is my, that's who I'm known as online. It's greensmoothiegirl.com. Um, we're in our 11th year, which is a long time on the internet. And, but I've been studying detoxification since I was sick. I was um, over 200 pounds and I had 21 diagnosed diseases and all diseases, inflammation and all diseases related to toxicity. And so in my 20s, you know, I had been I had been taught well. My mother and grandmother were health nuts. My grandmother had been diagnosed with a metastatic melanoma cancer. It was metastasized her breast, her lymphatic system, and she was told she had a year to live. And she said no to chemo and radiation. And she started doing the Gerson protocol, which is all about detoxifying the body and rebuilding the immune system, because functional practitioners see cancer differently than Western medicine does. And this was in 1981 that my grandmother was diagnosed and she really had everything to do with my earliest research and, and, and just watching what she did because it was, it was really astonishing to watch. She was told you're going to be dead in a year. You need chemo and radiation. You probably can live a few more years if you do that. And she didn't like it. She didn't want it. She's like, wait, that doesn't make any sense to, to burn myself with radiation that will keep burning for years, which is well known to cause cancer And then you want to inject all these cancer causing chemicals into my veins and hope that I survive it. Didn't make sense to her. So she said no. And everybody thought she was crazy. Well, my grandmother did the Gerson protocol. She was drinking like 11 glasses a day of fresh pressed green juice and vegetable juice. Um, She's doing things that are cytotoxic to cancer cells, like eating apricot pits, which has B17 in it or laetrile. Um, it was illegal in the United States in 1981. Now you can go get them on Amazon, but she, she did a bunch of things like that. And my grandmother beat cancer. She went on to live another 20 something years. And you know, I was a sophomore in high school when she was diagnosed and she was there when all four of my babies were born. Oh, that's and amazing. It, it was, it was a great inspiration to me. And she gave me the, my very first books 
when I started, you know, in my 20s and 30s, and I started to have friends diagnosed with cancer, I had, I had my grandmother come over and meet with them, and, and she gave me some of her books, and I started studying and studying and studying. And at the same time, I was not eating a healthy diet. I was eating a standard American diet because it's just so easy to default into. Like, you have to really care about it to opt out of it. And I was sick and fat. And when I did my very first detox in my 20s, I kind of had to slip it in between. I had, I had four babies in a row in seven years. And I had to be not nursing and not pregnant. That's important. If you're going to do a serious detox, you don't do it when you're pregnant because all those toxins come through all your bodily fluids. So it's going through your blood and it's going through your, your milk supply. So that's not a good time to detox. So I did my first one and I'll tell you, it was absolutely life changing. And it showed me how much power my body has to heal itself when I give it the right nutrition when I give it a break from all the, the garbage that I ate back then. And I, but the, the detox I did, you weren't eating anything for 20 days. You, I drank water. I drank, I was allowed to have some little bit of vegetable and fruit juice that I make myself with the juicer, you know, but we, we would drink a glass of water with psyllium husk powder and bentonite clay stirred into it. Mm, that was Let it. <laughs> Yeah, and then we took some supplements, and it's a super hardcore detox, and I have found that even just since I started doing that, what was that, 20, 20-ish years ago, I actually did that program three times over the course of a few years, and I, I actually eliminated some stuff that I had read. One of, one of the great researchers and clinicians whose work dramatically influenced me building my own program with all the best of all the greats all over the world in human detoxification is Bernard Jensen. And my grandmother had given me, given me one of his early books. He lived to be like 95 and he helped over 10,000 people eliminate from their colon this stuff called catarrhal mucoid plaque. And it's basically hard tire rubber like stuff. And I was so amazed looking at these pictures There are tons and tons and tons of pictures. And keep in mind, he was taking these pictures back in the like 60s, 70s of like you could pick it up with tongs what was coming out of people's small intestine all the way down through the transverse colon you can see where it came from based on the striations and based on the the, the shape of the the catarrhal mucoid plaque that came out and i read that i read bernard jensen's book and i was like if that is in me i want it out i can't i can't imagine that tire rubber is is inside my gastrointestinal tract, 35 feet of it, right? And it's not affecting these symptoms that I have. Like that can't be good for me. And so I was super curious about that. And I did that program for 20 and 21 days, the, the three different times I did it. And the only time catarrhal mucoid plot came out of me was that first time. It motivated me. Now I eat a mostly plant-based diet. I eat lots of fiber. I drink a quart a day of green smoothie. And I do that day in and day out. I mean you've been to conferences with me and if you're paying attention, you'll see my green juice or my green smoothie at the, at the table. I, I always have it. Even when I travel, I freeze it and put it in my suitcase. So I eat a much cleaner diet because I was so motivated by what happened in my first detox. But when tire rubber came out of me, I made a believer of me and catarrhal mucoid plaque is just one of the things that happens in the body when we eat, you know, processed flour and processed sugar and lots of animal products. We're not really built to eat as much animal protein as most people are doing. And so it was really astonishing and, and, and it set me on a path of research. I ended up many years later after studying the work of Bernard Jensen, Dr. Ann Wigmore, Max Gerson, who is an MD, came from Nazi Germany, helped tens of thousands of people heal of cancer either heal of the chemotherapy and radiation after the fact or heal of cancer without using chemo and radiation like my grandmother did. Um, the work of Dr. Richard Anderson. I, I not only studied all their work and, and my work, my protocol that I put together, which is the 26 day pre protocol, uses all of their best practices. But I also flew all over the world for about three and a half years and I went to 19 different functional medicine clinics or, or biological medicine is what's called in Europe. And I went all over the world 
to 19 different clinics and I interviewed dozens of doctors to learn what are people doing worldwide to detoxify, okay, because we've all got heavy metals in us and that puts you at very high risk for cancer and neurological disease. And what are they doing to rebuild their immune system? Because in functional medicine, we believe that cancer isn't a tumor. Cancer is, when you go underneath that, cancer is a catastrophic failure of the immune system. Mm. So when we clean all the crap out, our risk for disease is dramatically lower. And yes. so I do, it, I do it twice a year. I, I do two dedicated cleanses twice a year. I've led people through it. You, you asked me, you know, how, I, how many I've done. We've taken 10,000 people through the process. We've been doing it for four years now. We do it a couple times a year. And we're coming up on January when people are really motivated because their kids have had the flu. They've had something. Maybe they've had it twice by now, by the time you're listening to this. And they're super motivated to be stronger against viruses and bacteria. But guess what? When you get stronger against viruses and bacteria, you're also stronger against autoimmune progression. You're also stronger against cancer. Mm. So you use a 26-day cleanse, and I think it involves green smoothies. (laughs) That is is one of the foods you eat. That is all you eat. Okay. (laughs) Okay. So you have a mini cleanse in your vibe book. Is it similar yeah. to that or, or more components than that? It's kind of like a little slice of it. So you're getting, you're getting components of all of it, but the, the beauty of doing a 26 day program, and, and I think you're going to, you're going to offer your audience our free video masterclass. And it's four classes that I teach on camera. It's actually pretty well done and lots of pictures. And there's one of them where I'll warn you, but just, and then you could close your eyes if you want, but then I show you some of the output, like the stuff that you can pick up with, you know, tongs. And there are people, most people detox and they do not put a colander into the toilet, but there are lots of people who do. You know? <laughs> wow. if, you're, if you're either curious and geeky, or if you are very sick, you want to know, was that stuff in me that I've been reading about? And so we show some photos, but don't worry. In, in the video where we show that, I say, okay, hide your eyes if you don't want to see this. <laughs> Um, cause you know, here in the Western world, we don't, we don't like to talk about bowel movements and what's, what's been trapped in our GI tract. I do. I love it. Of course you do. We'll <laughs> see if your audience wants to see that or not. <laughs> it makes an impression though, right? When you see it, that. It's kind motivating. Of... It's yeah. motivating. So I recommend you don't cover your eyes, but, but give your audience this free video masterclass because okay. it's kind of like the cliff notes of what I've spent, you know, now 25 years studying and it helps you understand what what is inflammatory what is toxifying and detoxifying you know the last one the last video I I really I I created the video and then I had all my like 22 employees watch it and say should we do this video because it's it was a little bit emotional for me to make and it's kind of advanced um, content And it's about how when we release these old proteins that may have been trapped in organs of elimination, not only are they holding our organs of elimination back from being able to do their job very well, but you know what? Old negative emotions are trapped in that low vibration material. And when it is released, those energies may leave your body and you very well may find some emotional healing, some increased ability to forgive some letting go takes place as the body lets go the spirit the mind the soul also lets go and so I tell my experience with that first detox I had where where literally rubbery substances came out of my GI tract but if all that stuff coming out of my GI tract what's coming out of my kidneys that I can't see what's coming out of my liver I mean the liver is filtering your entire blood supply every four minutes And if you're eating a garbage diet, like I was 25 years ago, and I was feeding it to my oldest son too, and he was deathly ill. He was Mm. failure to thrive. He was below the fifth percentile for weight. He was born 23 inches and nine pounds. And he was in and out of hospitals. By a year old, he was on steroids, antibiotics, hormones. He was in and out of hospitals. He had, he had life-threatening asthma. I couldn't take, I didn't take him out. I didn't put him in babysitting. I didn't put him in the gym daycare. I couldn't take him to the church nursery. 
And turning our diet around was the one of the two big powerful things that we did. But the other thing is committing to a detox. And I will never be without this practice. Taking a break from these heavy foods that we all eat, taking a break for 26 days and eating only, they're actually pretty delicious, high fiber, nutrient dense, anti-inflammatory dishes and doing some some processes too where it's not our program is not just food it's also some practices that you do it is absolutely powerful i mean if you clean up the liver the liver does scientists believe between 500 and a thousand different things for us so when we clean up the liver because we, re- we rebuild our liver every 90 days. Like you're going to have a whole new liver in 90 days. And what you build it out of makes a difference in how it functions in, in potentially over 500 different ways. So doing a detox may have over 500 different benefits to you in the liver alone. Mm. So. Okay. I have a question about green smoothies. Mm-hmm. I'm glad that I have you on the hook. <laughs> so... Um, I just recently got my first Vitamix and, um, you know, I actually, it's great, but I will say, I do think you don't have to have a Vitamix to mix stuff. Um, I, I also like Nutribullet. Um, but so I, I just came a really great timing to read your book. That's about kind of plant-based and green foods. Cause I've been moving into a more plant-based diet on the work of Anthony Williams to help me with like viruses and stuff. So my, this is my question. When I make a green smoothie, there's foamy, fibrous stuff on the top, right? (laughs) We thought maybe the Vitamix would cure that, but it doesn't. Do I have to drink all of that stuff or can I just drink some of it or is it like optional? What's your take on that? Do you put a banana in? Not if I'm making like a green drink. No, I don't put a banana in. Put a banana in and that'll eliminate all that. Also, just put it in a jar and shake it up. Okay. And drink it. So you do want to have it. You want to consume it. It's important. Well, I don't know what you're putting in it because I've definitely had frothy green smoothies, but mine aren't. Mine have, you know, I might put sprouted flax in it, flaxseed. I, I usually put a chunk of turmeric in it, a chunk of ginger in it, um, and then just a bunch of greens. But then put fruit in there too. Put some frozen mixed berries will bring that froth down. You won't have frothy green smoothies. You have frozen mixed berries. I might put one apple, whatever organic apple I have on hand. And I usually have a banana, like a banana in the whole blender. It doesn't have to be a one banana per serving, but I use a Blendtec. I think the Blendtec is the best blender in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the Vitamix is the second best and nothing else really touches those two. Um, Nutribullet is good for traveling. And I agree with you. Don't, don't think that because you don't have a $400 blender, you can't make green smoothies. You just aren't going to be able to put a lot of frozen fruit in it. Okay. So yeah, I think I, like before I used to make more like smoothies with like a banana, almond butter, protein powder. But as I'm trying to do more of like a green drink, I'm not putting a banana or any of that other stuff. I, I do like it, but I don't really like all the fiber stuff. Um, you probably want a juice then. I do green juice too. Um, I usually order it from a juice store because, you know, you kind of have to ask yourself, do I have more time or do I have more money? Yeah. And I've, I've been in both places in my life having, you know, more time on my hands when I was a stay at home mom of four little kids, I had more time. Um, now I'm about to be an empty nester next year. Just one kid left. Um, I have lots of employees to help me with stuff. Now I have more money than time. And so I order from a, a, a local juice, um, place. I want it the way I want it. And they deliver it to me. And not everybody can get that, but a lot of people can. But you can also go pick it up. But I get six pints at a time. And here's what thing is, it won't be frothy and it won't be weird if it's juice. So you're you're trying to make a smoothie that most people would drink as a juice. If I were doing just greens and superfoods, no fruits, that that would be a tough one. Like getting your kids to drink that would be probably (laughs) impossible. (laughs) <laughs> like you have to pay them is good actually it's just the fiber you know they separate kind of so you can kind of taste yeah. the fiber more okay that's a good tip that's a good when tip. you blend fruit into it 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 it's a great emulsifier and and actually your kids will think it's super delicious 
um, if you put enough frozen mixed berries in it, they won't even know it's a green smoothie. They'll just think it's a smoothie. It'll be sort of brown or sort of purple. Mm, okay. Yeah. You know, you mentioned in your book that a lot of people do like kind of powdered smoothies and stuff. And I think that used to be more of my past. And I really feel like when I do fresh greens and fresh fruit, it just feels like so much more powerful and I'm switching over. I'll tell you what, <laughs> it feels right. Yeah. I, I, I probably get asked three times a week, you know, like when I have to fill out a form and say who I am or somebody locally is like, Oh, you're the green smoothie girl. This is always the next question. So do you sell green smoothies? And I say, no, we do not. A green smoothie is something you need to make at home. You yeah. got to make that yourself. There's no way around it. Those powdered greens are, they can be good in a pinch. They're good for traveling, but you know, Something is wrong when we aren't actually eating greens and fruits and superfoods, like the actual foods themselves, not some dried stuff that's been sitting in the supply chain for years. Like I said, nothing wrong with them. Some of them are really good and they don't have a bunch of junk and filler ingredients in it, but we really are best off when we just get that blender and throw in some kale and spinach and collards and don't be afraid of fruit. Okay, just because the fad diets are telling us fruit is bad for us, that they're telling us wrong. Fruits are the most high vibration foods they are, there are. And yeah, they have a lot of sugars if you're going to drink like fruit juice or whatever. But I've been putting fruit in my green smoothies for 24 years now. I mm -hmm. drink, I eat, in, especially in the form of green smoothies, I probably have three, four servings of fruits a day. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, not a problem I, when yeah. they're whole foods. Yeah, yeah, especially when you get all the fiber and such. And I don't know, there may be some people who are so insulin resistant and inflamed yeah. at the moment that they can't take some fruit. But yeah, yeah I, I really want to talk to you about like fad diets and plant-based diet because I was sort of in that, I wasn't like a card-carrying paleo, but paleo was so dominant for the last yeah. eight or 10 years or whatever. So I was sort of like on a paleo template, um, but I'm still like working on my health and I'm and I'm reading this person's work and it's like you know a little similar to yours like plant-based you know really encouraging juicing fruit like raw food and all the stuff and I thought you know what why not like let's have an open mind let's just try it and you talk about like the benefits of having vegetables having fruit and that there are these fads like I just got an email today number one trend for 2018 is ketogenic diet yeah, like I was gonna say <laughs> you know people don't realize with paleo diet it's not that somebody discovered the good diet it's that it was the diet industry's latest fad and and it's not there weren't good things about the paleo diet and it's on its way out and, and I've been predicting this I was on a 450 city speaking tour for six years and I Five years ago, I was saying on the stage, I was like, somebody write this down because I want, I want some credit for this. The next fad diet will glorify fat because it's time, because it's cyclical. And if you take a look from a high level at the diet industry, you know, I mean, we went, there's Adkins, there's uh, eat right for your blood type, there's low fat. Uh, as you said, paleo has been dominant. And so many of my peers, so many of the wellness influencers out there and, and the authors out there have jumped on that that paleo bandwagon hard and most of them are jumping off that wagon onto the ketogenic wag bandwagon. I'd rather have people do paleo all day rather than ketogenic. Ketogenic is far too high in fat. Hey, you know what? Fasting is good. Fasting is good for a lot of the same reasons that detoxing is good and fasting allows your body to reset. But they're talking about fasting like everybody should be obsessed with, you know, living on ketones on a regular basis. You should fast because you're giving bo your body a break from the heavy work of metabolizing, you know, the rich foods that Americans eat so much of. I'm way more interested in autophagy than I am ketogenesis. What's that? Autophagy is when you don't eat for a day or three days or in the last year, and this is not for everyone. If you, if you're, you know, have never done a major detox before, do not do this. Okay, this is for people who they're already running really clean. They already do a lot of things right. And I mean, I don't mean like you're doing some, you're eating he healthier than your neighbor across the street who eats out of the drive through every day. It's not relative to your neighbor. I'm talking about, do you eat a really, really healthy diet? I have three times in the last year done a water fast for seven days, nine days, and 12 days. So if you, if you want to powerful, powerfully kill the cancer cells in your body, you don't eat any food because then all these, all these, functions in the body that were devoted to, to 
to digesting food, they start digesting aberrant cells. So autophagy, when the body is not given anything but water, goes out and starts killing the cancer cells and killing the bacterial cells and metabolizing and eliminating the mycotoxins. And all these metabolites that are left there, they, they have nothing else to do and they have time to do the maintenance work that's needed to be done in, in organs of elimination. And so some of that is also happening in our detox program, even though you're eating and you're eating as much as you want, you're eating such nutrient dense foods and it's such, it's such light work for the body, like your meals will be digested in 20 to 40 minutes. So there's just a lot of repair work that can go on. So ketogenic diet, I hate that diet. I think, <laughs> I mean, I don't think I've stated it that, I don't think I've stated it that, that strongly with anyone before, but I'll tell you, eating bacon and butter all day is a bad idea. It's a terrible idea. Eating pork, pork is the dirtiest food there is, and butter is a flipping condiment. You should use a little bit of it. You know, it's not a staple. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, have to, we, I mean, I have a good friend who's a big ketogenic writer, and they were going to come back on the show, and I kind of weaseled out of it because I'm just like, I don't think I fully like believe in this. Like, I could see, like, I think it's good to change, mix things up in your body. That's probably healthy, but to like stay, I mean, it's, if you do it properly, ketogenic diet, it's like, you can eat like maybe a quarter cucumber a day. Like you can't hardly have any carbs. So you're missing all these micronutrients. And I know the theories in milk, but I, is that it's in the meat, but like, yeah, I just feel like it's, it's okay to kind of question things. Right. So I was doing this kind of high fat paleo diet and stuff like that, but you know, some, some of the times I feel the best are when I'm on cleanses, where I'm having a lot of salad and like kind of a lot more fresh food, which is kind of what I moved to, to now. And I definitely feel that energy you talk about and vibe, like I'm kind of vibing, you know, I'm it's almost like a little ungrounded when you're not used to it. <laughs> yeah. At first, uh, you know, we have people describe to us that they're buzzing. We had someone who's doing our detox right now. Um, we take a big group. We'll have a few thousand going through in January, but we have you know, a smaller number going through right now. And she said, my husband and I are both buzzing. Is that normal for us to buzz? And I'm like, well, you know, you're not used to your electromagnetic frequencies being 10 hertz higher. So yeah, I mean, the paleo diet gets people off of processed food and that's really good. And it's a lot better than the Atkins diet. I mean, the, you know what? Fasting is good. That doesn't mean the ketogenic diet is good. The ketogenic diet is just rebirthing the Atkins diet, which is probably the worst diet in the history of diets. And except they throw in a little twist, which they have to, because in order to make, you know, $22 billion, which is what happens every time you drive a new diet into, mm. you know, the, the food channels and, you know, the diet industry, but the diet industry really makes its money on all the, you know, keto approved, you know, labeled packaged foods in the stores and nobody's getting well and nobody's losing weight sustainably on you know, we're not supposed to eat that many fats and we're not supposed to eliminate carbohydrates. I mean, carbohydrates have been 70 to 80% of our food source since the dawn of man. And it's, it, you know, the paleo diet was sold to us as this is what paleolithic man ate. And you can go look at a great YouTube on that by a, by an anthropologist scientist showing that, that the way people are eating on the paleo diet has nothing to do with what paleolithic man was eating. First of all, first of all, you can't get, your, you can't get mammoth meat anymore. Second of all, a lot of the plants that paleo, paleolithic men were eating are extinct. Third, a lot of the meat people are eating on the paleo diet has all kinds of nasty in it, like steroids and hormones and antibiotics. And so I am friends with the paleo diet in that they're, getting people off of processed food. So people get on it and they feel better because they're not eating white flour and sugar and, and chemical sweeteners. And so there's some good things going on there, but my big issue with the paleo diet is how much meat people eating the paleo diet are eating. I mean, if you want to add to the work of the author that you've just read, make sure you read, I'll say these to you in case your, your audience wants to go read some of the incredible classic works covering each one of them has references this thick at the end like each one of these cites hundreds to thousands of studies my favorite recent one is dr michael greger md wrote how not to die 
<laughs> I think I've heard of that. Yeah, it was, it, I think it was the best well, nutrition and wellness book that came out in 2015, so it's new. Um, but my, my big heroes are probably Joel Furman, also an MD. He wrote Eat to Live in the, I think he's had like four New York Times bestsellers. So I think this was in the probably late 80s, early 90s. It's still very timely. Eat to Live. And he's going to tell you to eat plants. And he's going to tell you why to eat plants. And he's going to show you hundreds and hundreds of studies. You know, the Yale Meta Study. Uh, I think it was published in 2014, examined 10,000 pieces of published literature in the last 10 years. And the number one finding when meta studies look at lots and lots and lots of studies published on the same subject, number one finding of the Yale meta study by David Katz, MD, and his research team is, ready for it? Mm -hmm. Eating plants prevents disease. Eating plants prevents disease? Yeah. <laughs> More plants. <laughs> less animals. We need a lot less protein than the, the, these diet fads have led us to believe. Uh, that's something I was wondering too. You, you said in your book, you know, you, you really like a plant-based diet and get 10% protein is enough. And cause that's another thing I question like this with the diet I'm doing now, I usually just have one serving of meat at dinner, like a small serving. And, um, it feels like a good balance to me, but yeah, I was like, well, what about, I was supposed to get 30 grams of protein within two hours of waking. That's a lot of protein that I'm not getting. Who, who came up with, who came up with counting grams of protein? Where'd that come from? I have no idea. Protein powder industry. <laughs> it came from the, it came from the diet and processed food industry. Mm, the it's a way of quantifying food that has nothing at all to do with your health. Mm. It doesn't even have anything to do with your weight. And so the processed food industry and the meat and dairy industries and the diet industry want us to think about stupid concepts like counting calories and counting grams of macronutrients, but that's not where the story is told. Mm. You know, yeah. we're, we're unlikely if we're eating whole foods, if we're eating almost any version of a whole foods diet where the processed foods are gone and we're just eating from the greens, vegetables, fruits, legumes, whole grains, nuts and seeds, and a little animal product if you want. Um, you're not going to, like, there's a pretty big, wide variability in how many grams of proteins, fats, and carbs you can eat and still be healthy. Um, you look at the healthiest people all over the world, like the Blue Zones research did, and, you know, most of them are all but vegetarian. A couple of them are pretty strictly vegetarian, especially the one in North America, the the um, Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda, but none of them eat very much animal protein. And, and none of them eat the dirty animal proteins that we do, like, you know, bacon and hot dogs and, and you know, barbecued burgers. And, and I know people are listening to this and going, well, you're talking about my favorite foods. But, you know, I'm not saying become a vegetarian. I'm saying eat more plants. Yeah. You know, to be honest, when people would tell me, like I have a friend who's vegan, he's like, I just want people to be more plant-based or our friend Rita Marie, she's like vegetables first. And it's almost like I didn't, it didn't fully equate somehow, but you really have to put some other things to the side to, to, to grab onto that. I think that's where maybe paleo falls flat. They do kind of put the meat high and they don't say, Hey, think about eating vegetables first. So you just fill it with meat, you fill the empty space with yeah. meat. You know, they, they don't, they definitely do not uh, tell you to limit your meat. And it, there, it's funny. There's one study about people who've been on, there's people have been on the paleo diet or, you know, that nobody stays on it for very long usually. And nobody stays on the ketogenic diet. It's just not sustainable. Like nobody's going to eat like that long term. Um, but, you know, the study said that when you ask people what the paleo diet has been for them, ironically, the answer is uh, eating more vegetables. Oh, really? And so if that's what the paleo diet is, then I'm for it. I'm right. For it because yeah. vegetables are nutrient dense foods. They have the most fiber, they're low in calories and they're massively high in all the micronutrients. That's where the story is told. The story is not told in grams of protein. If everybody just let go of thinking about grams of protein, guess what? Nobody's thought about grams of protein until the last 50 years and look how that served us, right? They'd be getting well because they counted their grams of protein and, yeah. and, put, and put scoops of weird 
processed whey protein in their in their blender. I mean, the story is told in the micronutrients. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what Jason and Mira Carlton talk a lot about, and I, I that really resonates with me. You know, you, you you talk about the function of the kidney and the liver and all that, like how do they get to function? You talked about making a new liver. Well, what do you want to make it out of? Well, it wants all the things that it wants. It wants glutathione and B vitamins and stuff. And if you can get those from a quality source, then I think it matters. Like if it's whale blubber or, <laughs> or plant yeah. or whatever. So yeah, I, I like that one too. And yeah, I, I just kind of want to introduce to your audience, like this is kind of something I'm trying and thinking about. It's something you've been doing a long time it's just maybe something to like kind of open the mind to again, like question, like, do we need 30 grams of protein in the morning? Do we, I remember when I go out to eat, you know, I, I am very ethical about the meat I eat. And so I go out to eat, you know, the meat is usually garbage. So I, I would be like, well, what am I going to order? And I'd be afraid to just have vegetables. <laughs> so I thought, well, I need the meat or I'll be hungry. I don't know. Like, I think that's just a construct though. It's just like we become used to eating meat all the time. So. Yeah. I, um, I think about grams of protein never. (laughs) And I think about calories never. And, um, I don't think it's helpful, but I think that we've all been brainwashed to think that that's really important. And then we get really, crazy. Like you have to actually be really smart and you have to be really planning ahead and you have to be almost obsessive to put all that silliness in our heads that the diet and food manufactured food industry wants us to be thinking about and go think about what actually matters, which is the levels of micronutrients and eating the rainbow and that all those different colors of natural whole plant foods have what we need. I mean, you add those two things together and most people's brains will explode. So, I mean, you know what, if you eat greens, vegetables, fruits, legumes, whole grains, that doesn't have to be gluten grains, nuts and seeds. I mean, that's my diet. That was my mother's diet. That was my grandmother's diet. Um, when my grandmother got diagnosed with cancer, we, we owned a produce company that distributed produce all over the Southern states, Arizona, where you live, Texas, New Mexico, called the Romney Produce Company. My mother was Eleanor Brown Romney. And my cousin ran for president. And so you may have heard that last thing before. And so we had warehouses full of fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds. And so my grandmother was doing some things right. But this was back in early 80s. She had spent a few decades drinking Dr. Pepper all day <laughs> long. Like this was before it got really clear how incredibly toxic soda was for it for us from the 50s till about the eighties, you know, we had to eat something for a long time to like have the research about it come out. Now we're starting to have a lot of research coming out about the non-helpful effects of the paleo diet. Yeah. So, so <laughs> everybody's like loosening. It's funny right now. All the paleo people are loosening. Oh, go ahead and drink some of this. <laughs> just go, just go watch out there. How many of our peers are jumping from paleo to keto? And you know what? Here's, here's my next prediction. In five years, there'll be a new diet. And keto will be on its way out because guess what? They don't even have to go out and do the research on keto because it's already done. It's the Adkins diet. The Adkins mm-hmm. diet was a catastrophe for American public health interests. I don't know much about it really. I had, so that's. You're too young. That's why you weren't here for it. <laughs> so I feel like kind of what you're describing is a little bit of intuitive eating, which I think only really can kick in when we're eating clean food. Cause it's when you're like addicted to different processed foods, mm-hmm. you can't really eat intuitively. I read this interesting study once that they did with like toddlers, which was like, if they put them in a room with just a variety of foods I don't know how they did this study, but this is a claim. They, they would intuitively eat what they needed, even if it was like kind of weird stuff. So I think that we can get back to that too when we kind of clean out. I don't know if, do you find that too, like for yourself and your cleansies? Yeah, you know, intuitive eating is interesting to me. I read one of the first, I think the first intuitive eating book that came out and there's some good truisms there. But you know what? We lose our ability to eat intuitively when we train our children onto processed foods because, yeah. you know, I mean, sugar is more addictive than cocaine. So you, you start feeding your baby um, sugar. I'm sure nobody listening to this puts soda in their baby's uh, baby bottle, but a lot of people do. A lot of people do. 
Um, We've all seen it. We've all seen babies with Coca-Cola in their baby bottle and it happened more 20 years ago than now. But even like the Infamil and Similac, it's lots and lots of sugar and it's processed sugar, which is different than the simple sugars that are natural in mother's breast milk. And so when you make a, sh- a little cocaine addict out of your baby, and I'm, <laughs> I'm joking, right? Like it, I'm joking because you don't, you're not really snorting cocaine, but it's more addictive than that. Then you can put a rainbow of chopped, you know, yellow, red, and orange bell peppers in front of them and they don't want it. They don't yeah. want it. So, yeah. but, you know, I always ask people to do an experiment and I, I've been interested to see how many people do not have never gone a whole day without sugar. But if you go four days without sugar, then you may feel like a crack addict, you know, like, oh, I've got to have it. I've got to have it. I've got to have it. <laughs> Listen, pay attention. It's an interesting experiment in how you've trained your brain to need dopamine hits. If you go four days without sugar, those sliced bell pepper sl- slices will taste completely different to you than they did four days before. When you have done some, even just four days of detoxifying off of sugar, our body is supposed to resonate with vegetables. And it does, it does. When you go through a detox, the thing that's so great, like people come out of it, they're just soaring. They're like, my mood has lifted. My joints don't hurt. I lost, the average weight loss in our 26 day program is 12.5 pounds. And there's no calorie counting. You eat as much as you want. One of the biggest things people tell us is I can't eat all this. Like all the recipes you've given me and all the food that I bought, like, I can't eat all this. You know, sometimes people eat it all, but some, sometimes, especially little people like you are like, I, you know, this is a lot of food. You can eat as much as you want. And literally the average weight loss is 12 and a half pounds in 26 days. And we've had wow. people get in the bod pod or get their body fat measured. And 90 to 95% of that, that loss is fat. And, you know, part of the reason for that is that your fat stores actually have a job that they do for you. If you have like, I don't know, Bridget, did you have um, human anatomy where you worked on cadavers in college? Mm, I don't think human cadavers. No. Well, I was lucky to go to a university that could actually get their hands on every semester. They got their hands on cadavers. So we had three, there's three cadavers every semester. And one of our cadavers, the semester I took human anatomy was very overweight. And so we saw what fat deposits look like. They look like if you have big clumps of cheddar cheese and you leave it out in the sun, like they're, they, it looks a lot like that, kind of like melty um, uh, cheese. And they are an organ. They are doing an important thing for you. They attract, fat attacks, attracts toxins. Mm-hmm. And it holds those toxins, talking about heavy metals, talking about, you know, volatile organic compounds, talking about all the glyphosate that we eat in our foods. And it's, it's brilliant. Like we need our fat because if it's holding all the glyphosate and, you know, neurotoxic food additive chemicals out of our kidneys and, and liver, that's where it would kill us. Hmm. So yeah. we need our fat stores. And so when we detoxify, fat loss is much easier because you're, you're given those fat stores a pink slip. You're saying, we don't need you anymore. We're getting rid of all these chemical toxins and fat doesn't have a job to do anymore. That, that's the job that fat does is it keeps toxicity out of your critical organ functions. Yeah. I mean, so many people are obese because they're holding toxins from like all the processed food and, and meat they eat, and they don't realize, they don't understand like why it's happening. So I think you sent me a, a talking point earlier that like, why is detoxing better than dieting? And this is why we're letting go of those toxins in our fat tissue. And so our, our organs can function better. Um, yeah, those are amazing results. I'm sure people are really interested in that. <laughs> yeah, detoxing is so much more effective than dieting because when you diet, all you're doing is suppressing calories and you're counting and slicing, you know, you're slicing and dicing your grams of proteins, fats, and carbs, and whatever, whatever fad diet you're following will favor either protein or fat these days, these days, which is so sad because the carbohydrate, like people talk about carbs and I just, uh, I can't stand it. And people say carbs, carbs is a meaningless word because an apple is a carb and a donut is a carb and they don't even belong on the same planet. <laughs> Go back to donut planet. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, and, and people talk like, oh, carbs. I just look at a carb and it ends up on my hips. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Processed food ends up on yeah. your hips. I mean, yeah. you, you eliminate the carbohydrates. You just eliminated fiber. So, I mean, Dr. Adkins, back at the time of the Adkins set, which is the, to this day, it's the most sex, successful diet in the history of diet. Billion dollar empire. The guy died of heart disease. Um, and it was so successful because he was telling Americans to eat what they wanted to eat anyway. <laughs> Have all the burgers and cheese and bacon and butter that you want. It's back. It's back. It's called the ketogenic diet. Only, only they mix in some fasting. Okay. Well, before we close up, I want to talk about something else from your book that I thought was really interesting that I'm curious about. Now, you talked about fulvic acid and humic acid adding to your water. And I really perked up because... I've been doing this more like fruit and like eating more often and it's kind of feeling helpful, but I would still really tank in the afternoon. And I was like, something is, is not right. Adaptogens don't work. Eating more doesn't work. So I started looking into electrolytes. I'm still like a bit of a novice, but I started, you know, putting more electrolytes in my water and I listened to a lecture about it. And then you mentioned this fulvic and humic acid. And I was like, what is that? I want this. I went out and got it the same day. <laughs> so tell us more about like this aspect of this kind of tip that I think a lot of people are missing as well. Yeah, fulvic and humic acids are found in decaying plant matter. And decaying plant matter is what feeds our crops, like in a, in a natural ecosystem, not what they do now, which is they spray nitrogen on the top of the plants and, and, um, but, in an ideal situation, there's all this decaying plant matter, we might call it, you know, hummus or compost or, but eventually deep in the ground, this decaying plant matter turns to shale, it eventually becomes rock over the course of thousands of years. And what most of the supplement industry does is they take rocks and chalk and they grind them up. You can actually, you can, if you have the right equipment, you can grind up rocks and chalk and it's, you know, then they can sell really inexpensive mineral supplements. Minerals are incredibly important because every single thing that your body does draws on your minerals. And there's about 90 of them. If you lump all the minerals like, you know, calcium and magnesium and, you know, the ones that you know of, there's a smaller group of those, but then there's a whole lot of trace minerals. You don't need very much. They're trace minerals, but over 90 of them. And when you take rocks and chalk and grind them up, guess what? They have lots of minerals in them. They might even have some shale might have, all 90 minerals. And the problem with most of the supplements is your body doesn't actually metabolize rocks or chalk, does not recognize it as food. And so it's not what we call bioavailable. Well, before it turns into rocks and chalk, when it is still decaying plant matter, if you take that dark black substance out, that's the fulvic and the humic acids. And we, I, I had a really excellent experience the first time I started using it, but then I found out that company's product was a little bit of fulvic and humic in a quart of water. And that makes it, you know, that's from a manufacturing standpoint, that makes it seem like I got a lot of, I got a, I have a lot of it here. No, you have a quart of water with a little bit of fulvic and humic in it. So green smoothie girls, most popular product is our completely concentrated. It's black. It's liquid in a dropper full and you put a dropper full in your water first thing in the morning and last thing at night, and I'm telling you what, it, the effects that people have are absolutely amazing. I was using another company's product, and then I found out how much water it was, and I was like, I don't want to ship, I don't want to ship water all over the United States. You know, that's like not a good use of fossil fuels, and so I wanted just fulvic and humic acid. You add it to your own water. So we got this product. It's out of organic plant matter in Texas, actually, and it supplies every single mineral. It's rich in electrolytes. It's alkalizing. It oxygenates. Um, and so people are just low in minerals. And like I said, you need minerals for every single thing your body does. You're constantly depleting those mineral reserves. When I started using fulvic and humic acid, the fulvic acid allows you to bring nutrition inside the cell better. No, other way around. Fulvic acid helps push out toxins from the cell. Humic acid helps bring the increased cell permeability and bring the nutrition that you're eating inside the cell, helps you nu use nutrition better. And it's what, what our plants, our crops are supposed to be getting their nutrition from, but most of our soils are depleted. So we might be eating our greens and our vegetables and fruits and nuts, but the tree 
or the plant isn't able to bring all that nutrition out of the dirt like it used to be because we over farm the, the soil. So using this was miraculous for me and it caused me to go and make a better version of it because here's, here's the things that happened. My, my hair started to grow faster and my nails started to grow faster. And I was like, what is going on here? I don't like to have long nails because I'm a competitive tennis player and a pianist. So I don't want long nails. But I was like, I'm having to cut my nails every week. Um, hair growing thicker and longer. I already have thick, long hair, but it like was crazy. It was absolutely yeah. crazy. And we've had hundreds of people tell us this. It's our most repurchased product. But another thing that it did that I was not expecting is, and I had to go to our biochemist and say, what's going on here? Is that I had like 30 years of insomnia. It did take me, I don't know, hour, two hours to fall asleep. And then I might wake up in the middle of the night and not be able to go back to sleep. And that's miserable, right? Just miserable. Disappeared. When I started using fulvic and humic eight years ago, disappeared and hasn't come back. Mm. Even when I'm on, under a lot of stress and I'm worrying about something, I fall asleep in minutes, which I did not do the first, you know, 40 years of my life. Um, and I also wake up with, with energy. And here's why. This is what our biochemist told us. She's like, remember, I've told you, and I kept going back to her and say, why, why did this happen? Why did this happen? All these health benefits. And she said, remember, every single process in the body uses minerals. So mm -hmm. when you're supplying your body those minerals, first thing in the morning when you wake up, you're depleted. And right before bed, you're depleted. You're giving your whole neurological system the raw materials it needs to do its job. And what is the neurological system's job at 11 p.m.? Sleeping, cleaning yeah. out your brain. <laughs> yes, yes. It's, it's time to rest, rebuild, repair. So you give it the materials to do that, and now it can rest, rebuild, repair. And then first thing in the morning, you take those minerals again. And what's your neurological system's job at 6, 6 a.m.? Wake up, have energy. Yeah, we Eliminate. need to go. Yeah, we need to go do our, you know, rocket science or whatever it is we do all day. We need our, we need our brain firing during the day. We don't need our brain firing at night. That's a, that's a misfire. That's a neurological problem when you're having all these thinky thoughts at 2 a.m. Not supposed to happen. Mm, that's a good point. Yeah, I, I appreciate you indulging me to talk about this because I think it just, it just brings out a point like there's little things we can miss even if we're doing like some healthy habits and yeah, I had this feel. I'm like, what? Why am I still so tired? I would say taking like more electrolytes is 50% reduce that fatigue, which is still like pretty significant. Um, I mean, that's, that's a big help for me to not be fuzzy headed like I was. So yeah, I think minerals are definitely an area we overlook. I, I know you sold one, but I was like, Sometimes I learned about something, I want to run out and buy it immediately, uh, which I did. Are you a supplement junkie like me? I'm a total supplement junkie. <laughs> I've tried everything. Um, so, but I'll go buy yours in that smaller one because, yeah, mine is large, and I couldn't really travel with it either. So that's perfect. I'll tell you what. When you travel, when you travel, double your dose because it's probably your very best sort of anti-aging, anti-radiation protection. Mm -hmm because you're going to use up a lot more minerals when you go through TSA, when you get on an airplane and you're exposed to so much radiation. A lot of people go on a trip and they feel so exhausted by air travel. You don't have to do that. So instead of one dropper full in your water first thing in the morning and one dropper full at night, double up. Now it can be really detoxifying. So when you get started, don't, don't double up when you very first start using fulvic and humic, especially use it in really potent like ours. Um, and I, don't, I can't find any anywhere that's not super diluted. If ours was any more concentrated, it would be a solid. Like it, it, like we took as much water out of it, you know, like there's it to stay in solution. It would, uh, you know, there's as much in there as we can get. And so start with one morning and night, but then after you've done that for a week or so, if you don't have like a little more, you know, eliminating going on, you, you're feeling good, then put it in your water after you go through, um, well, you can't because you can't take it through. I think it's more than, I think it's four ounces. You could probably get through TSA with it. But I always have it in my suitcase. I, I roll it up. Remember, it's like black, black liquid. And when, when you put it in a glass of water, you won't taste it. It's pretty flavorless. So you, you know? check a bag and you put in like 
your frozen smoothie and your folic acid and all your all your goodies that keep you healthy. <laughs> yeah, I take frozen green juice and I have the like I said, I have the juice bar close by make me just it's just green. If it's juice, you'll you'll like the taste of it. It's nice. It's not thick because it's just juice. I might have put a little lemon juice in it, but no fruit. Um, with a smoothie, I put fruit in it because you got to get that thick stuff down. And without fruit, it's just most people won't do that. They just won't do it. So when I travel, I, I freeze that fresh pressed green juice and I mm. wrap it up in a bag and I roll it up in a pair of jeans or whatever. And then when I get there, it can slowly de defrost or I put in the, fr the fridge in my hotel room. But you know, so I, I travel with green juice. I don't travel with frozen green smoothies because thawed green smoothies are gross. Ugh. The fiber doesn't unthaw well. Okay, that makes no. sense. Yeah, it's worth it to check the bag. People are so averse to checking a bag. I don't really think it slows you down that much to check a bag and then you'll have to haul it around everywhere, which is nice. Yeah, so let's but, look, but you ahead. can make your frozen green juice through, through TSA. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, as long as it's frozen, it's a solid. <laughs> So silly. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. Okay. So we're going to share a link to some free videos that you did. Um, you mentioned some of them. So there's could toxicity be why I'm sick, how to change your weight set point forever. I like that one. Eight foods that help you detoxify and how physical detox can resolve emotional problems. So you just kind of drip these out and people can kind of take them in and yeah, actually, when you sign up to get this free video masterclass, we actually let you watch all four of them because we find people, ah. if we only let them watch one at a time and drip one out every day, then they're like, give me the other one, give me the other one. And so a lot of times people watch all four in a day. Um, and like I said, don't watch that last one, which is pretty advanced stuff on how we emotionally help resolve re emotional problems when we do a physical detox. Um, watch that one last because you'll have a good foundation for it with videos number one two and three. And, and I really like, you know, the second one on change, cha how to change your weight set point by detoxifying. And, and it has everything to do with what we were talking about a little bit earlier of, of the fact that you're releasing your fat stores from the job that they're doing. And you do a detoxification process as opposed to dieting because dieting, all it's doing is suppressing calories and, and you'll lose weight, but why not detoxify instead? And then weight loss is one of the many health benefits. Yeah. And there are many, many, many. And I think you, like you said, or I think in your book, it's like more sex drive, thinking clear, all these things. But frankly, weight is often one that like gets people to sign up, I'm sure. Well, it's the number one thing on people's minds. And I find we can't get people to talk about how's your liver functioning, you know, and how's your, how's your um, digestion working? If they have weight to lose, that's their number one goal. So yeah. you know, we don't have to just lose the weight and then think about that. Let's, let's do it all at once with a, with a detox instead of a diet. Well, Robin, I'm really interested in doing your detox. I'm like a little scared, but I also think you'd make it really fun because you make things fun. So <laughs> it's really fun. And I do, if people join us for the full support, you'll learn a little more about the, the detox program in the free video masterclass. Just take the free video masterclass and see if it's for you. I mean, one of the things we cover is what's hard about a detox and what's fun and easy about a detox. And then do it if it's your time. If this is the time for you, you know, when I started learning about detoxifying, like I said, I was pregnant and then I was nursing and then I was pregnant and I was nursing and I was like all in and I was, you know, it's like, are the health benefits you want to achieve greater than your anxiety about it? And I'm glad you said, I'm a little nervous about it because that's, that's okay. Um, we always have anxiety about doing something that's unfamiliar that we've never done before, but we have a super active Facebook page in January. Like last January, we had someone posting every two minutes, <laughs> like not the same four hours a day. I have two full-time detoxinistas who man, unless, unless they have to sleep, they are manning that thing because in January people are going crazy and they're sharing their stories. They're sharing their wins. They, they tell us what's happening in their body, which really motivates everybody else. Um, and they're asking their questions and they're talking about their Herxheimer reactions because you know, some people do get a headache. If you're a big caffeine drinker, you know, headache is, is, you know, distinct oh, possibility. And so, you know, don't be scared because I did it all by myself without a detox buddy. We suggest you bring a detox buddy with you. They can help, you know, do the food prep with you. Somebody who lives in your house or close by is really, really good, but also just somebody for accountability. 
Mm-hmm. Okay? If your addictions have you by the throat and you're like, I have to eat some brownies or whatever your thing is, or some chips, you got to check in with your detox buddy first and they will keep you strong and they'll get you through that four minutes where you think you're going to die if you don't have chips. And then five minutes later, you're like, dang, I don't even care now. Yeah. You know? cleanse- cleanses are so great for cl- cravings because normally we just cave. But if we're like, oh, I want this cleanse. I can't have it. You do. It, it passes. And then like later it becomes easier. I think that's one of the biggest wins and habits and also like just the cooking and food prep, which most people don't do a lot of cooking and food prep. Right. Uh, so to get on that habit, I mean, the, I, those aren't like benefits, so to speak, but to me as a health coach, those are like, the most best benefits for me is just seeing people do habit change. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Robin. This was such a pleasure. It's been a pleasure for me too, Bridget. It's always fun to hang out with you. Can't wait to see you in Miami. (laughs) (laughs) 